morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here with your smiling faces. If you would stand with me as we do our call to worship this morning. Psalm 141, verses 1 through 4, says, O Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as an evening ser- Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds, in company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. Let's bow as we pray. Lord, I thank you so very, very much for all that you have done for us. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve your love. And yet you died for us. You died to pay our sin debt. I pray that we would never, ever get over that. I pray that we would, as we begin our service this morning, we would be focused on you, that we would set aside all the, the busyness and the, the pressures of, of life and work and everything else. We would set that all aside and just focus on you. I pray that you would please allow your Holy Spirit to work in each one of our hearts and lives, that he would have free reign here to change us to be more like you. I thank you so much for all that you're doing, Lord. I pray that you would continue in Jesus' name. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart.
you turn to your neighbor and greet them this morning. Good morning. It's great to see all of you this morning. It's a pleasure to have you here and worship all together. If you're visiting Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church for the first time, we would like you to fill out a card in the pew rack there in front of you. We just want a record of your visit. But I also want to encourage you to do this. If you want to know more about Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church, go to our website. You can find all the information about the church, church calendar. Uh, you can find out information, past sermons. Read our statement of faith as to what we believe here at Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. So I want to encourage you to do that. That's mgbconline.com, mgbconline.com. We are uh, blessed this morning to have Jim and Amy. Is Amy here? She's here? Okay, all right. Jim and Amy Lee. Now, I was corrected this morning. Pastor Brandt corrected me. I originally thought that Amy, Amy Buchanan, was a Covite. Many of you know Gary and Trudy Buchanan. Buchanan. Uh, I originally thought that Amy was a Covite. Brandt informed me she is not. She, she grew up at, on catfish. So that's not technically in the cove. So she's a holidays burger, not a, not a Covite, okay? Um, so on the catfish there towards Newry, Duncansville. Uh, Jim and Amy, Amy have four children. They're with Wycliffe Bible Translators, currently located in Brazil. And so would you please come forward and tell us a little bit about what uh, God is doing through you there in Brazil. Good morning. She is. Uh, Amy and I, our kids, just returned from Brazil. Um, we completed our second missionary term, and we've been serving in Brazil with Wycliffe Bible Translators for seven and a half years. Uh, we very much appreciate your prayers, your encouragement, and your financial support for our ministry. Okay, I heard Pastor Brian let you know that we have four children. Natasha is 10, Jenna is 9, Thomas is 6, and Michaela is 2. Um, during our second term, I homeschooled our three oldest children, and I'm also the education materials coordinator for our Brazil team. I serve in graphics and in administration uh, for our Brazil team. I design and produce materials for our translation teams and create promotional materials. I also design for a Brazilian partner aviation mission, Asas de Socorro, uh, translated Winds of Help. Okay, we are very privileged to participate in what God is doing in Brazil and very much appreciate your partnership with us. One of, example of this uh, partnership was two years ago, your first and third grade through third grade SMM um, girls class on Wednesday night, they held a baby shower for us on Skype. 
when we were when I was expecting Michaela. So that was a real blessing to us to have that. So thank you for that. And finally, we'd like to um, we're excited to share this New Testament uh, dedication video of the Nadub People Group located in the Amazon. Uh, our colleagues Hodolfo and Beatrice Sen were the Bible translators. They, are, they now work with a uh, partner mission in Argentina where Hodolfo grew up. After the service, if you have time, uh, we have a table in the back and we'd love to talk with you, all right? Thank you. This region is about as unreachable as any place in the world. There's still areas that we fly over that have never been contacted by people. And really, there's nothing, there's no roads, no highways. Down in the jungle, it's a harsh reality where uh, if you're off of a trail, even an indigenous person won't survive. And when I'm flying over the jungle and I look down and I realize there might be somebody down there that has never heard the word of God in their language. It's one of the things that keeps me excited or animated about the, the work that's going on in this region. Cuando llegamos acá hace 16 años, nos encontramos con un pueblo que inclusive en sus historias eh, siempre hablaban de que la gente de afuera, la gente no nadab, siempre era más y ellos eran menos. Había muchos chismes el uno sobre el otro y eso creaba muchos problemas. I think jealousy is also um, used to be a big problem and for us it was hard because sometimes we would like we wanted to help somebody or give something to somebody and then um, everybody else was jealous. En el año 2000, eh, aconteció cuando esta señora Socorro, que era una chica de 13 años en la época, estaba enferma de cáncer y un día nos dijeron que, que oremos por uh, Socorro porque eh, posiblemente no va a vivir. Entonces eh, le dijimos a la gente que comience a orar, inclusive... Eh, gente que todavía no eran cristianos, que no eran creyentes todavía. Uno de los ancianos que le, lo llamábamos de abuelo, yo le dije, abuelo, hoy tenés que orar a Dios, al que vive en las alturas, como le dicen a Dios, porque socorro va a ser operada y los médicos dicen que no tiene mucha esperanza. Se me dice, eh, nieto, ya oré. <risa> Allí, 
Es, esa época fue el, el tiempo en que nació la iglesia. El mismo tiempo que comenzaron a leer las escrituras que habíamos traducido, los primeros libros. Y se ve que todo el pueblo quería seguir a ese, a ese Señor, a ese Dios que vive en las alturas. Hoy en día hay mucha gente que ha cambiado, que realmente tiene un deseo de, de vivir una vida cristiana sincera. Firmemente creo en, en el poder transformador de la Palabra de Dios. La Palabra de Dios transforma a la gente. Como los transforma a nosotros, los transformó a los madres. ยิงกะตะมาดปายิงกะนึดมาปะยิงกะนานังดปายิงกะนึดปาหิยินหะเปิดปายิงหะเปิดเฮกยิตะเฮมะฮงดุบลาปะเอดุเกมะเปิดติ
la promesa que hay en, en Apocalipsis, que una vez gente de todo pueblo, de toda raza, de toda lengua, estarán ante el trono de Dios, del Cordero, alabando a Dios. Y yo le dije a Andrade, yo quiero estar junto con los David cuando cantemos a Dios. Thank you for that report, Jim and Amy. We appreciate the opportunity to join with you as you translate the Word of God. A couple of uh, months ago, uh, we uh, prayed over Lindsay Smith as she went to South Africa to work in a children's home there as well as a hospital. So I'm going to ask Lindsay if she would come forward and briefly share uh, her experience. And I think you have some slides to show us too. So, here you go. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Um, yeah, there, there'll just be pictures um, in the background, uh, but it's good to be up here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you just a piece of what I experienced um, over the past few months. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was at Msalani in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, um, and I was, um, you know, in the hospital and children's home there. It's a very rural place. Um, Honestly, I think I could have started a list titled, Hardest Things I Have Ever Done. Um, I only just arrived back in the country two weeks ago, um, and so I don't think I'm far enough away from my experience to be able to stand up here and tell you everything I, I grew from and learned and stuff like that, um, but I will tell you what I know. And um, I do know that it was hard and it was difficult. Um, I didn't think I've ever been that far outside of my comfort zone. Um, I so quickly came to the end of myself, the end of my dreams and expectations and ideals, um, that I ultimately was forced to step out on God's rock, his, his promises, his plan, and his protection. <laughs> that's all I had. Um, it turns out that that's the best thing I could have done. Um, you know, earlier this year, I, I remember praying, God, um, strengthen my faith, grow my faith. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was praying for, um, but I firmly believe that he answered that prayer just in a much different way than I was expecting. Um, so what exactly did I do um, the past two months in South Africa? As I said, I was at Msalini, um, which is a very uh, rural, traditionally African town. Um, South Africa is a very diverse country, but where I was was up in the northeast corner of South Africa, right below Mozambique, um, along the coast and um, it was very rural. Um, almost all of the people, besides doctors, therapists, and a few others, were Zulu, one of the largest tribes in South Africa. I stayed with Victor and Rachel Fredland, who were um, British. Oh, and I went with SIM, um, um, uh, the, the like, me leading medical missions organization in the world. But I stayed with the missionary couple there, uh, Rachel and Victor Fredland. Um, Victor is the CEO of the hospital there, which is almost a 200-bed hospital. And Rachel is the um, CEO, kind of, of the children's home. Um, I spent the majority of my time in the hospital, functioning as a nurse. Um, I still have one more year of school left. Um, and I also spent my afternoons helping one or two teenagers with their homework. Um, in the hospital, on one of the wards, I was actually able to fill a hole in their nursing staff because they had lost one of their RNs um, due to an illness, uh, but she recovered and was back, back to work. 
Um, I, I learned so much about practicing medicine in, in that kind of setting. The social issues and the, the, the lack of resources, um, learning to work with those um, was really, um, I learned so much from that. Um, and I wish I could have more pictures of the hospital, but I wasn't really allowed to uh, take those pictures. Um, but the patient I have up there, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's non Tobacco. We had some fun together. Um, but the, the, the patient I have a, a picture up there, she consented. So it's fine. Um, anyways, as I said, I also uh, spent some time in the children's home helping with homework. Um, and I'm so thankful I was able to uh, spend a bit of time getting to know some of the kids that lived there and listening to their stories. Um, I spent most of my time with Olile, who was permanently in a wheelchair and for various reasons was unable to get the, gear, the care that she needed um, at home, and so she was sent to the children's home. And actually, a lot of the kids had stories like that. Um, many, many of them had HIV. Um, all of them were affected by HIV. Um, a lot of them were orphans, um, abused, neglected. Um, but the redemptive stories that they could share um, because of Jesus Christ in their lives was inspiring, and I'm so glad that I, I was privileged to listen to them. Um, oh, but it's funny. Um, a lot of the homework of Olile that she needed help with was in agriculture. <laughs> and I just found it amusing. Um, I thought to myself, the farm is never going to leave me alone no matter where I go. <laughs> this is not a bad thing. <laughs> um, lastly, I also really enjoyed learning about the culture and the language and the people there. Um, I especially got to know two Zulus, Palos and Lindo. Um, and they taught me uh, this fun tongue twister in Zulu. Um, <laughs> and that means beware the chicken crossing the road. Um, no, but after dinner, um, we'd have a lot of fun washing the dishes. And in the evenings, we'd spend time together. And they'd teach me a few things. Um, however, a few weeks into my trip, um, I began to realize that none of these things mattered all that much in the end. Um, I started feeling like I was missing out on something, um, and I soon realized that my focus had been askew. I was so enjoying soaking up the experience and learning lessons and integrating into the culture um, that I had forgot to be a representative of Jesus um, in this new place. One Sunday, I was really talking to God about this, um, and I was praying for opportunities to share the gospel with someone when a new um, occupational therapist student arrived at the Fredlands home. Um, and the Fredlands, they would often, they would host um, students and short-termers all the time, sometimes up to 20 people at one time. Um, but my bedroom was directly above the kitchen, and um, so I could hear everything that was going on um, in that room. So while I was praying for an opportunity to share Jesus with someone, I hear Rachel, the missionary, um, ask the new student, so are you spiritual? Uh, what do you believe? <laughs> I can't tell you how fast I ran down to that kitchen so I could be a part of that conversation. Um, and ever since then, the, that student and I had really good conversations, and that was a gift from God, most certainly. Um, and um, ever since that afternoon, my focus had been shifted. Uh, while I couldn't, you know, do much in the hospital, I didn't know Issy Zulu very well, um, I could reach out to, this, to the students and the short-termers that stayed in the Fredlands home. Um, and I was able to talk about him with the next few visitors that the Fredlands hosted. Um, I wanted to end with that story because I want to encourage you, my family, with this. We all are called to mission of living wherever we are at, wherever God places us. Um, I don't know how to tell you that to make you truly believe it. And maybe you do. Um, but maybe you're like me and you need a reminder every once in a while. Um, while God could send you to Africa to share himself with those people there, he could also have you in this place to share himself with the people you are around right now. Um, it doesn't matter where we are at, and it, it actually doesn't matter what we are doing. Um, it only matters if you are doing it from, through, and to Jesus, if you are building his kingdom. Um, while things can get messy, difficult, and just not fun sometimes, we have the hope and grace of Jesus 
both to sustain ourselves and also to shine out to our neighbors. Um, so I just want to thank you guys so much um, for praying for me and supporting me. I, I can't tell you the value that that has. Um, I couldn't tell you. Um, and, Joy, to end, um, I thought I would share a short video um, of the nurses singing a song before our shift started. Um, I couldn't take many pictures, but I did sneak a video. Um, and I, it's, it's just a traditional worship Zulu song, and I thought it would be cool to end with this. So they are singing Ngena, which is come in. They're inviting people to come into the family of God. Um, so, Salakafe. <laughs> Just a few announcements. As always, make sure you read through your bulletin. This Friday, the block party, August 14th, starting at 5 o'clock and running through 8.30. Concert by Them Preachers. We also have food available. There'll be games for the kids. Uh, this is put on by the Martinsburg Ministerium in order to raise funds for Cove Christmas Love. If you'd like to help out with this event, make sure you contact myself or talk to Rachel in the church office. Uh, we're also looking for bake sale items for that uh, event. If you would like to bake some uh, food to sell, uh, we would highly encourage you to do that. Again, you can talk to Rachel or myself. Danny and Cheryl Horton are putting together a missions trip to Haiti. If you are interested in uh, joining them next February, uh, please make sure that you contact them. Last week in your bulletin, there was an insert for the Del Grosso's um, celebration, district celebration. Please make sure that you sign up and register for that if you intend to go to the Del Grosso celebration on uh, the September 6th. September 6th is the date for that. Nursery helpers are needed as well as Wednesday night leaders and helpers. So if you would like to help out in the nursery or on Wednesday nights with the children's program, please make sure you talk to Jerry. We are in desperate need of some helpers in both of those areas. That's it. As always, again, just a reminder, make sure that you take a look at your bulletin or go to our website mgbconline.com and you can find out uh, more information on announcements there. Oh, me again. One thing I forgot to tell you. Family Fun Festival at the Stern Farm, August the 23rd. Starts at 10 o'clock with coffee and donuts, and the actual worship service starts at 11. You need to bring a chair, a hot dish, and a cold dish to pass, as well as your place settings. It's going to be a great day, great time of worship. Fun games for the kids, baptism service. If any of you are interested in being baptized, please make sure you see me or Pastor Tim. It's going to be an awesome day, bounce houses, all sorts of activities, a lot of food and fellowship. So we'll see you at the Stern Farm, August 23rd. Lots going on. Be sure to read through your bulletin, just as a reminder, or go to MGBC online. As the gentlemen come forward this morning for our offering, we just wanted to pray for... Uh, uh, Jerry and Ken Stern, the passing of Vera, 
uh, and the family. We want to uh, pray for them. As well as uh, many of you know, Ken Rice, who attends here, is uh, on his way to Angola. He will be going there as an agricultural consultant, and uh, we pray that he will be able to not only assist them in planting crops, but also assist them in planting the gospel. And we want to continue to pray for Lindsay as well as Jim and Amy Lee. Guys, I'm getting a little bit of ring up here. You might be able to tweak that a little bit. But gentlemen, if you'll come forward, we'll go ahead and pray for our morning offering. Thanks. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you have provided with us this morning. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for the missions uh, reports that have been given this morning. And we thank you and praise you for that. And pray that you'll continue to uh, bless Jim, Amy, their family, as well as Lindsay and their future uh, as they uh, seek to um, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to bring forth the uh, Stern family in the passing of Vera and just ask that you would be a blessing of peace and comfort upon them during this difficult time, the viewing tomorrow and then the funeral on Tuesday. And for Ken, as he travels to Angola, uh, I know he goes there with an agricultural organization, but I know what first and foremost on his heart is planning the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that inroads may be made there as he works in Angola. So, Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to give back to you a portion of that which you have given to us. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built Then Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Would you stand and sing with us this morning? Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of
shall go with trumpet sound. Who may I then in him be found? And dressed in his righteousness
children be dismissed. So I just want to ask everybody to, uh, let's just close our eyes and uh, bow our heads for a minute. Um, man, God, you've, uh, <laughs> you've taken us all over the world. You've given us opportunities that we never thought possible, whether it's where we've lived our entire life or where we've been in the last few months. Um, and Father, I just pray that, that as we sang that last song, that we truly are overwhelmed by you. Um, and God, as we, as we ask your spirit just to come into this place, um, Lord, I pray that you would just look into our hearts right now. Um, God, let's just ask you, just whatever, whatever we're going through, whatever we're distracted by this morning, um, just take that. Let's just take a minute and do that. God, we thank you for this, uh, just this opportunity to be in your presence. Father, we'd be receptive to what your spirit is saying to us. And as Brian preaches, Father, that <laughs> Father, we would just take in your love.
Father, we desire your spirit here. You are already around us, Father, but in the next few minutes, we invite your spirit within our hearts. Convict us, shape us, change us through the power of your spirit, not through our head knowledge, not through things that we might think or know, but, Father, through what your spirit speaks to us. So we invite your Holy Spirit impact us again shape us and change us in the name of your son jesus christ amen thank you you may be seated thank you praise team for doing an outstanding job of leading us into worship this morning last week I ask you to do an assessment of your words. I suggested that throughout the week you think about the words that you use as you interact and correspond with other individuals. I even suggested that you open yourself up to accountability to a spouse or another person that is close to you. So how did it go? What did you learn? Maybe you weren't really paying attention last week and forgot to do so. Or maybe you weren't here last week, so you didn't get the homework assignment. So today we're going to give you an opportunity to catch up a little bit. So let's just make a a brief, quick assessment here. Think back to your verbal interactions this week. Was the conversation appropriate? Was it inappropriate? What was the tone of your words? How about your body language? What did you communicate? Was it in a fit of anger? Did you give in to the pressure and join in the conversation because of the people around you? 
Did you spend time talking about people that weren't even there at the time? What did you feel like during those conversations? Did you use words this past week that fit under any of the following? Gossip and slander, flattery, boasting, exaggeration, murmuring or complaining, angry words, cursing, using God's name in vain, perverse, sexual, or sensual speech, rebellious words, or perhaps lying. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, page 530 if you're using the Pew Bible. Page 530 if you're using the Pew Bible there. Matthew chapter 12. While you're turning there, let me give you a little context as you're flipping through the pages to the first uh, book in the New Testament. Jesus has just committed three violations of the law according to the Pharisees. His disciples had eaten grain on the Sabbath. Jesus had healed a man's withered hand. And finally, they bring a demon-possessed man to him, and Jesus would completely restore him also. The Pharisees then, seeing this, would respond to Jesus and the community, the, the congregation that's there, his disciples and those around, that he's carrying out this ability to do this. He has the authority to do these miracles because he is of Satan. After hearing this, Jesus rationally explains to them that how can good things be done by Satan? He, he explains it to them. He begins to then zero in on the flawedness of their words. The accusation of him being from Satan and his power to heal coming from the evil one, he says, are spoken from your heart because your hearts are filled with evil. Your hearts are revealing your inner thoughts about me, is what he's saying. Verse 33, Jesus says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of your heart the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil things stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. If you came here this morning with pencil and paper ready to write down Pastor Brian's ten tips to tongue taming, you're going to be disappointed. I would like to tell you that it's easy. When you're going to say something bad, count to ten. Or when you're going to speak something evil about someone, bite your tongue. Or just go by the old philosophy, if you can't say anything good about somebody, don't say anything at all. I would like to tell you that that's that simple, but in reality, that will not work. Why? Because Jesus tells us that the root source of the problem is not our head, but our heart. Out of the overflow of the heart... The mouth speaks. A sinful heart equals sinful speech. Make a tree good, Jesus says. It's as simple as that. It is a problem of the old nature and the new nature. There's a constant battle between the two. Jesus tells them, make a tree good and you get good fruit. The tree is recognized by its fruit. That is why we began this series in James. We wanted to take a look at our hearts and see what it means to live out the Christian life in front of other individuals. And Jesus says, make sure that the heart is good. Make sure the tree is good and it'll produce good fruit. He says, make the tree good and you get good fruit. He turns to the Pharisees, though, and says, your hearts are filled with deadly snake venom. That's why you just said that I am of Satan. So how do we get a good heart? Well, first of all, we have to examine the condition of it. No cardiologist has a person that comes to them and says, I'm having trouble with my heart, immediately schedules them for surgery and goes in and cuts. He assesses the heart. He takes a look at the heart. He tries to figure out what is the disease of the heart. Is it arrhythmia? Is, are there blockages in there? He, he tries to diagnose and find out what the disease is before he begins to treat Dr. Joseph Stoll, in his book, The Weight of Your Words, 
measuring the impact of what you say. And by the way, it's available in our church library. He says that there are really three conditions of the heart that lead to the problem of the tongue. Each of these is evident in this interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees, as we read in Matthew 12. Stoll says that we often will speak words of bitterness, mocking, slander, envy, hatred, any number of them from three different causes. First, the fearful heart. When we are afraid, we sometimes speak words of hurt. We may be afraid of those that have uh, come alongside us that might take away our position or our status at work. We speak words of hurt if we feel that we might lose a friendship. Perhaps we feel a loss of material possessions of our home or financial security. Fear of losing control in a parent-child relationship. They're not obeying us. They're not listening to us the way we should. And so we start to fear and it causes anger and bitter words come out. The new guy comes to work and begins to make a solid impression in front of the boss. You see it. The rest of your co-workers sees it. So suddenly you fear losing your status at the place of employment. And the next thing you know, you're around the water cooler, spreading false gossip and false statements about that individual just to knock them down a peg or two and kind of level the playing field. This was the thought of the Pharisees in this passage. They saw the status, their status as religious leaders being usurped by this upstart preacher named Jesus. They held high status in that area. They had everything that they wanted. They had power, leadership, authority, lodging, food, financial reward, and they saw it slipping away. They were fearful, so they spoke out against Jesus. The second disease that affects our heart are anger, angry heart. C.S. Lewis says, anger is the anesthesia of the mind. Get that? Anger is the anesthesia of the mind. What, what he means by that is that sometimes we get angry and it numbs us in the thought process so much that we can actually justify the words that we're saying. We can actually justify that we can hurt that individual. Well, I'm so angry. Even when we go to that individual and apologize later, you may say, hey, I, I'm sorry for what I said, you know, an hour or so ago. I, but you have to understand I was really angry. Like that now makes it right. Anger is the anesthesia of the mind. Anger is really selfish. It seems to justify or make our words right. Jesus had just violated their most sacred Sabbath laws, according to them. He also healed and worked on the Sabbath and restored a man's withered hand. So is he a lawbreaker or is he a gracious healer? And the Pharisees are confused. They don't know and they're angry and so they lash out at Jesus. From their very hearts come the words, You're of the devil. And Jesus says, Frankly, that's unforgivable. I got to believe that the religious leaders are furious with the people's response to Jesus. Are they really thinking this upstart guy is the son of David? Really? You see, sometimes our anger gets misdirected. Perhaps the um, Pharisees are really not so much upset with Jesus as they are with the people following after him. But they lash out against Jesus. You know, we call it the kick the cat syndrome. You're at work. Things don't go well at work. You get frustrated. You leave. You get in your car. 30 minutes. Drive home. Come in the door at 5 o'clock and kick the cat. The cat didn't do anything. What's more dangerous is sometimes we don't kick the cat. We end up kicking a loved one. We lash out against our spouse or against our children or against friends or any number of things, not because of them, but the anger that was displaced and not taken care of at work. The third disease that Stoll says is the prideful heart. Humility covers a multitude of sins of speech because in essence, all of that really, if you dig down to the root of it, is pride. Most of our sinful words come from pride. It's one of the most dangerous heart conditions that we can possess. You see, in the eyes of the religious leaders here in Matthew 12, Jesus and his disciples are untrained. Where did these guys come from? Who are they? 
Who did you follow? Who was your rabbi? We've spent years memorizing scripture. We've spent years leading the people, the nation of Israel, in their religious pursuits. And who are you then to come in? Where have you been trained? And all of a sudden, they don't understand this pride starts to well up within them. That this Jesus is starting to garner so much attention. They've dedicated their very lives to knowing the law and God's word. And here comes this guy with no training at all. Actually, he's the one that wrote the words. No training at all. Remember the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel? Hannah could not bear any children, right? And her husband has another wife, Paniah. And she's giving birth to children right and left. And Paniah keeps degrading Hannah in front of her husband, in front of the, the, the community, saying, look, at, she's not able to bear any kids. She's provoking her and mocking her, and um, she's irritating Hannah. Well, after Hannah gives birth to a child, she says this. She said, the reason why Paniah was so mean to me, the reason why she said those things is that it was about pride. Pride was the reason. Pride was what was inflicting her heart. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist confronts the religious leaders about their need to repent of their sins. You know, he goes to them and he's, he's talking to them and telling them you need to repent. And they said, well, Abraham is our father. Pride. Pride. It's pride that causes us to exaggerate the truth about ourselves so we look a little bit better than the other guy. It's pride that drives us to dominate and control the conversation when we're in a group. It's pride that tells us to go ahead and tell that off-color story around the water cooler so we fit in just a little bit better. Oftentimes we say negative and derogatory th things about other individuals to reduce their standing and to elevate ourselves in the eyes of others. Pride can be so subtle. Let me give you an example in my own life. Someone comes up to me in the street and says, Hey, do you know so-and-so? Yes, I do. They attend my church. My church? My church? They attend my Sunday school. My Sunday school class? It's so subtle. It's so easy. Pride is elevating self at the expense of God and what he has provided. Fear, anger, pride, diseases of the heart, deep-rooted conditions that can impact our words. Like us, though, the Pharisees are probably thinking these are just words, Jesus. The, the, these are just words. So he goes on to tell them in verses 36 and 37. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. I, I thought Jesus judged the heart. I mean, when we go to heaven, he's going to judge the heart, right? But he says here that he's going to judge our words. Do you know why? Because there's a direct connection between our heart and our words. The feelings and the thoughts of our heart come out in our word. God is going to judge our hearts, but our words are directly associated with it. So clearly controlling our words is not about tips, strategies, counting to ten, or memorizing a moral code. It's a heart issue. That's why James says, no man can tame the heart. To, excuse me, can tame the tongue. He says, no man can do that. Do you know why? Because only the Spirit, only God can tame our tongue. To illustrate this, Jesus then talked about getting good fruit from a good tree. No man can make the tree good. That's Jesus' point. He's telling them, make the tree good and you'll get good fruit. Well, in their mind, they have to be thinking, how, how do we do this? Jesus is telling me, I, I can do that. Follow me. Accept me. Invite the Holy Spirit in. I, I, I can help you with that. So, this is a spiritual battle, not a head battle. This is a heart issue, not a head issue. What do we do? Where do we go today? Well, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. It's page 635. Verse 22 through 27. 635, Ephesians 4, 22. 
You were taught with regard to your former way of life, the old nature, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. There's a battle between our old nature. That's the one that causes our mouth to say bad things about people, to say sinful, hurtful things. And then there's the new nature. That's the nature that causes us to speak words of encouragement and support and life. Paul says to put on the new self, not that we are God, but that we are created to be like God. Notice he goes on to say to put off falsehood. That is, our conversation, actions, and our very lives need to be built on the truth. So build a foundation of truth. You know, in our society today, We've become accustomed so much to untruth that it's, it's, it's almost like we just accept it. I mean, take com TV commercials, for example. When you see a TV commercial about soap powder that makes clothes whiter than any other type of soap powder, you immediately know what? And that's probably not true. Or, or like when you eat a piece of gum and it's supposed to keep your mouth fresh for 24 hours... It's a commercial. It's probably not true. They're saying it, but it's probably... Or the truck that you can buy that gives you 22 miles to the gallon highway. Yeah, probably not true, right? We are so indoctrinated in all of that that, you know, we can get support and approval at work if we close the deal by just telling a little bit of a lie telling the exaggeration or a false statement or an outright lie, if we close the deal, if we make the sale, if we get the assignment done, it, it, it's okay. It's okay to do that. And all of a sudden, telling lies and exaggerations is a virtue. It's something to aspire to. You know, we can twist our words and manipulate a little bit and get this accomplished. It's not a really big deal. And the next thing you know, we're telling lies. Here's the problem. God is a God of truth. Truth aligns us with God. If our words and actions or character are not based upon truth, then anything we say or do, like the TV commercials I just mentioned, anything we say or do is now suspect. As falsehood builds in our heart, eventually it's reflected in our words. We become a walking commercial touting 22 miles to the gallon when we know that that's false. If we're creating the image of God, a God of truth, then we need to start here, the foundation of our words. Is your heart and my heart reflecting a heart of truth? Or are we always teetering on the edge of flattery, exaggeration, false statements, white lies, or outright lying? Along with seeing ourselves, though, in this manner, being created in the image of God, we need to see others created in the image of God. The Holy Spirit helps us control our tongue when we see others are created in His image. Hold your place there in Ephesians and turn back to James chapter 3. Keep a finger in Ephesians and turn back to James chapter 3. Verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men. Quite a dichotomy there. Who have been made in God's likeness. Clearly James is telling us, I know you speak evil and you curse men, and that's wrong. Why is it wrong? He says, because men and women whom we're directing these comments are created in the image of God. Think about it for a minute. If we could look at people... No matter their age, their sex, behavior, skin color, history, mistakes of the past, if we could look at people and see them as being created in God's image, do you understand what a difference that would make in the words that come out of our mouth? 
I mean, these people are creating God's image and loved by him so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give his very life for those individuals. These are the same individuals that James says we curse with our mouth. If we can begin to see them as being created in God's image, we would have a totally different verbal perspective of that individual. Jump back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. He says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their deeds, that it might benefit those who listen. Picture the individual, your spouse, your coworker, the child at home, like an empty bucket. The intent is to pour cool, refreshing water of words of encouragement into that bucket. But every time they get a negative comment, every time that they get something um, abusive towards them or bitterness towards them or hurtful or mistrust, it's like poking a hole in the bucket. This is a loved one we're talking about. Hey, listen, the world's going to poke enough holes in that child's bucket. They don't need to get it at home, too. Our intent is to fill the bucket up, not to poke holes in it. The world is going to do that on its own. We as parents and grandparents do not need to puncture their self-esteem anymore with words of bitterness. We need to see them as individuals created in the image of God, deeply loved by him so much he would send his son to die for them. Seeing these people as creation, as God's creation and created in his image will help us to stop poking holes in their buckets. Finally, humility. Humility will result in more listening and less talking. Humility will result in more listening and less talking. More righteous action and less talk. Turn with me to one final passage, Philippians. It's right after Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 2. <clears throat> starting in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Selfish ambition. Don't compete. That's what that means. Don't compete. Don't try to verbally one-up the other person. Don't strive to make your story more dramatic than their story. Oh, I went to the doctor, dentist's office the other day, and Dr. Kurtz drilled my tooth. Man, did it hurt. Oh, I went there. I'm sorry, Doug, didn't mean to hurt you. But, you know, we always want to up one up, you know, and we want to make our situation more difficult than theirs. Don't correct your spouse in front of other individuals. You can do that at home in private. Don't compete. See others with humility and consider them better than yourselves. In reality, what we're doing here is seeing them as created in the image of God. It becomes that way, and then it changes our heart feelings, the way it comes out of our heart. Each should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. That's intentionality. We need to be intentional about this. So let's wrap up. Controlling our tongue is not a matter of self-discipline. It's not a matter of any type of behavior modification. It's not a matter of our head, but a matter of our heart. We saw that our hurtful words can come from fear and pride and anger. And Jesus provides us with a perfect example here in Philippians in verse 5 to 8. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude with respect to your words should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing. He humbles himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He submits, he humbles himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Want to control your words? Get a handle on your pride and your anger and fear. Start again, if necessary, to build a foundation of your life based upon truth and relationships. Focus on living it and speaking it. Meditate on God's Word. The Spirit will use it to convict you when you're tempted. It will be a matter of your heart telling you, that's not right, don't say it. Prayer. Prayer is the ultimate form of worship. When we pray, we're telling God that we know that He exists and we ask Him to help us. Yes, even help us control our tongue. 
see others created in the image of God. Stopping, stop poking holes in their bucket. Begin to pour words of encouragement and refreshment into their lives. And finally, finally, spend time with Jesus. Our words come from our heart. And we're followers of Christ. We desire to be followers of Christ. But we have to get to know who Jesus is. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke. See Jesus in his life. See how he engages people. See how he interacts with people. See the words that he speaks under certain circumstances. Get to know him. Look at what he does, what he says. And seek to apply them to our own lives. And we'll begin to have better control over our tongues. Father, this is such a difficult challenge for us. There is not an individual in this auditorium here today that does not struggle with the words that come out of our mouth. In a culture and society that just throws words around carelessly, and as we saw last week, can even cause people to do significant harm to themselves. Father, we just ask that you would help us to change our heart through the power of your Spirit. It's not a matter of self-discipline. It's not a matter of our head it's a matter of a heart change to a new nature that only you can provide. May the Holy Spirit come in and push out the old nature, the nature of bitterness and words of venom and hurt, and pour into us fresh, encouraging water and change our hearts so that we can help to change others through the power of our encouraging words. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen.
yours. I am love. I may pure. I have life. I can breathe. I am here. I am free. Father, our words, they flow from our heart. We need you to indwell our heart, Father. We need you to strengthen it. We need you to provide us with the spiritual power to push out the old nature and allow the new nature of Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts. From there, our words will then flow and it will be like cool water, encouraging others. Father, without a clean heart, without you in our heart, we're going to rely on our head it's just not going to work. It's going to be too late. And the words will already be out. They'll already be gone. Convict us and strengthen us as we go. Change us to be more like you. I pray this week we'll spend time getting to know Jesus Christ and allowing him to fill our hearts. We ask this in the name of your son. Amen.